In this video, we're going to look at multiplying radical expressions. Uh, we're going to look at a few different types of examples that we might see. One thing that I like to keep in mind when I'm multiplying radical expressions, I don't necessarily want to multiply the numbers together because I might end up with some really, really big numbers. Generally what I do is I try to think if the numbers that I have, the radicands that I have, do they have any uh, common factors? And if so, do they have enough to make a perfect whatever power we need uh, e e expression? Um, so one thing I, I like to just know is that if we have uh, the square root of a squared, that's going to equal just an a outside the radical. So I don't necessarily need to, let, let me do this as a number. So uh, if I have the square root of 6 squared, that's going to equal 6. I don't need to actually do 6 squared. I just know that if I have a square and the square root, that those will cancel out. We are uh, assuming that all variables do represent non-negative, so that's not going to be an issue. So we do get to make this assumption that A is something positive. OK, so as we look through these again, I'm not necessarily going to multiply the numbers. Like in letter A, we have the square root of 2 times the square root of 10. That one's not so bad, because when you multiply 2 times 10, it's not like we're dealing with some ridiculous number. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the square root of 2, and we can apply this principle that says if we have two radicals being multiplied and they have the same index, we can combine the radicands using multiplication. So I could rewrite this as the square root of 2 times 10. And then I can think, OK, do 2 and 10 have any common factors? They do. They have a common factor of 2. So then I would write this as 2 times 2 times 5. Well, 2 times 2, that's the same thing as 2 squared. And the square root of 2 squared is 2 outside the radical. So then this would become 2 times radical 5. You can go through the whole motion if you want. You could write 2 times 2 as 4. You could write it as 2 squared. I generally don't do that because I know that if I have 2 of something, that that will pop out of the radical as just a single, right? The square root of 2 times 2 is equal to 2. So then 2 times radical 5 would be the simplified answer for letter A. Letter B, we have the square root of 20 times the square root of 54. Again, I don't really want to multiply these numbers. In this case, it makes sense. I'm going to end up with some really big number if I do that. I think it's going to be 1,080. I don't know perfect square factors of 1,080. So instead, I'm just going to think, OK, first of all, 54 has a perfect square factor. Um, 9 goes into it. So I'm going to, when I rewrite this, I'm going to rewrite 54 as uh, 9 times 6. That way, I have that perfect square. So now I have one perfect square of 9, whose root is 3. I'm going to focus on the 20 and the 6. Wait, 20 has a perfect square factor of 2. 20 has a perfect square factor of 4. So I'm going to write that as 4 times 5 times 9 times 6. OK, the perfect squares, so the 4 and the 9 I'm going to ignore because they're going to pop out of the radical in just a second. It's the 5 and the 6 that I want to look at. Do 5 and 6 have any perfect square factors? Um, it, or do they have any common factors besides 1? No, because 5 is prime. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the square root of 4, which is 2. We're going to take the square root of 9, which is 3. And then we're oh, putting equals. That should be a time sign. And then we're going to leave anything that's stuck under the radical, which would be the 5 and the 6. Now we're going to clean this up. The coefficient is 2 times 3, which is 6. And under the radical is 5 times 6, which is 30. So when we simplify and multiply, we end up with 6 radical 30. Now, I could have simplified each radical separately first. I chose not to do that, but you totally can, and that's, that, that will work, and it might, maybe it'll save you a step. I don't know. If you like that better, you could, you could try that. Letter C is a little bit different. This time, we're going to use the distributive property. So we're distributing the radical 3 to radical 15 and to radical 3. And again, when I combine the, the radicands, I'm going to leave them multiplied out. I'm going to leave them factored. OK, so we distribute here. We get 3 times 15 under the first radical. I distribute here. I get 3 times 3 under the second radical. 3 times 15. So 15 has a factor of 3 in it. So that would be 3 times 3 times 5. And then the square root of 3 times 3, we, you might know, is, is just 3. So a 3 would pop out of that radical. Here, a 3 is also going to pop out of the radical. So we're going to be left with 3 radical 5 minus 3. Notice the only thing left under the radical is that radical 5. All right, letter D, we're going back to not having uh, little expressions there. So again, it's up to you. Here, I uh, combined first and then kind of simplified as I went. 
Um, when we're dealing with numbers, I would generally stick with this strategy if you want to try to simplify the 21st, because we know that we can. You can do that. Um, with the variables, I would probably suggest combining them first and then looking at different strategies that we can use to simplify. So if you want to, you can go ahead and simplify the radical 20. Uh, 20 has a perfect square factor of 4. So if we take the square root of 4, we all have a 2 as our coefficient. So I'm just going to put that 2 here now, and then I'm going to combine everything else. Here we have 5, and there's still a 5 left over there. a cubed times a cubed would be a to the 6th b squared times b cubed would be b to the fifth, right? When we combine variables with exponents, we add the exponents. Now the 5 times 5, that's a perfect square, right? That's 5 times 5 is 25, the square root. So a 5 will pop out of the radical, so we're going to have 2 times 5. And then a to the sixth, that's a perfect square. Uh, the root of a to the sixth, remember what we do? We take the exponent, we divide by the index of 2, and we would get a cubed. The B is a little bit trickier. So here's what I suggest doing when we uh, don't have a variable who's, uh, that is a perfect square or a perfect whatever root we're trying to find. What I suggest doing is rewriting B to the fifth as B to the highest power that we can get that is a perfect, perfect power of, in this case, perfect square, power of two, and then put whatever multiplies with it, right? Because we can, we can break up 5. So 5 we could write as 1 plus 4, 2 plus 3, 0 plus 5. Um, so the biggest perfect square that goes into b to the fifth is b to the fourth. And it'd be b to the fourth times b to the first, which is just b. Now I can take the square root of b to the fourth. The square root of b to the fourth is b squared. And what am I left with? The only thing that's left under the radical here is B. I'm going to rewrite this because it's kind of messy and we need to combine the uh, numerical coefficient. So the 2 came out of the radical because of the 20 had that perfect square of 4. The 5 came out of the radical because we ended up with two factors of 5. Um, so we want to multiply those. 2 times 5 is 10. The a cubed came out of the radical because a to the 6th was a perfect square whose root was cubed. And a b squared came out of the radical because we rewrote b to the 5th as b to the 4th. That's the highest perfect square under 5 times what's left over, which would be a b. And that b is the only thing that remains under the radical. So our final simplified multiplied answer would be 10a cubed b squared times the square root of b. Whew, OK, letter e. We have 2 times the cubed root of 3 times 4 times the cubed root of 9. So in this case, for something to come out of the radical, we need 3. It needs to be something to the third, or it needs to be one of those perfect square, uh, perfect cubes that we've discussed in the past. Um, what we can do is we can multiply these coefficients. 2 times 4 is 8. And then, let's see, we have 3. And then 9 is 3 and 3. So lo and behold, here we have 3 of one factor. We could think about this as 3 cubed. If you multiply it out, it's 27. And Whichever way makes sense to you, that is a perfect cube. We have three of the same, therefore it's a perfect cube. That means a three comes out of the radical. We have nothing left under the radical, so we can omit that sign. We can multiply. Eight times three is 24. Our last example, we have the fourth root of 81 times the fourth root of 32. Uh, 81 is actually a perfect power of four, and its root is three. So we could just go ahead and write that. and. That way we're just we're done with that one. 32 has a perfect power of 4. Uh, the factor that's perfect power of 4 that goes into 32 is 16. We, so we could write this as 16 times 2. And the fourth root of 16 is 2. So if 2 would pop out of the radical, and we would have a 2 left under the radical. We want to multiply anything that needs to be cleaned up. So 3 times 2 is 6. And the fourth root of 2 would just stay the fourth root of 2.